Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Carroll, um, and I am a senior software crafter at A Flight. We're going to be talking about uh, my experiences with uh, WebRTC, uh, clean code, um, and uh, the challenges and opportunities in test driven, well abstracted real time communications. Uh, so, uh, buckle in. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, a time. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll be a fun time. All right, let me switch this over. I'm also OBS operating for myself right now, so um, uh, in case you are uh, knowing about that. Okay, well, uh, my name is Ian Carroll. I'm a senior software crafter at Aethlite. Um, I'm self-taught. Uh, I have a, uh, I was, uh, I taught myself software engineering while working at a bookstore, um, and I used a scrum of one to do it. Um, before that, I was a theater major. In fact, I studied Shakespeare at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art for a brief period of time, for a summer. It was a great summer. Uh, hmm. uh, so, uh, any case though, uh, I'm also a Taoist philosopher, and if you're wondering what that means, uh, it really just means I make a good cup of tea. So, if you need advice on how to make tea, uh, yeah, just come straight over to me. It's fine. Um, okay. So, I also do improv theater, and in fact, uh, right now in LA, I am doing a show later today using this same setup uh, where I'm going to be improvising a full length play in the style of uh, a famous author. In this case, it's going to be William Shakespeare, and we're going to be doing um, Roman Shakespeare improvised. Uh, and um, I used to do that in a theater, but uh, the theater closed. Um, because we can't actually assemble anymore. So, um, I was in a little bit of a, an existential crisis about what exactly to do with myself. Uh, so I started, um, going into maybe figuring out how to do online performances, uh, using Twitch, Zoom, OBS, uh, and streaming real-time communications. Because I thought to myself, well, I'm a software engineer. How hard can it be to, uh, just make this work? Uh, I mean, we've got phones on your laptop, phones on your camera, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. So yeah, uh, these cameras work, so how hard, hard could it actually be uh, to just make this work? But there's a lot going on with these cameras. And that's one thing that I discovered over a year of being alone in my apartment and trying to figure out how to make this work where I could actually be uh, working with other people again. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there is, there, there, there is so much that's, that's happening here. Um, and what they really are doing is they're making a lot of assumptions about what you want. Uh, let me give you an example here. Um, I'm going to do a side-by-side -side view of my two cameras. Now, one of these, uh, the one that you're seeing right now, and as I transition over to the other one, now you may notice there's some di differences in picture quality. One of the first things you might notice is the camera angle. Uh, that's because the camera in this case is fixed to the monitor on my laptop and it's expecting me to have this monitor set up like this and me working this way. Framed correctly now, right? But uh, the other thing, um, I'm not sure if you can tell um, unless you're uh, doing the side by side on Twitch, uh, but there is a little difference in how my face looks in each of these. Uh, and that's because of the fact that this camera, the one that uh, is on my laptop, is a wide-angle lens. And they're almost all wide-angle lenses. Um, and the only reason to do that is because you need to be close to the, to the person. And the person also wants to have a wide view of the rest of their room so that they can sit back or they can move around. And they're still in frame, basically. Uh, to be in frame in a tighter view is something that's a little bit more professional. Another thing is that this camera right here, it comes standard with the laptop. You don't have to pay for it at all. There's no extra cost. And so it makes you wonder why would you buy an expensive camera if the one that you have in your laptop is good enough. Um, and so the key, key thing here is that it's making a lot of assumptions. You also notice that the colors are a lot brighter uh, on this camera. It's because of the fact that it's choosing the color that rather than me making that manual choice like I did on this on, on the other camera. Um, also, it will autofocus. So if I step further away, uh, it actually keeps me in focus. The other camera won't do that. It's manual. Um, but 
that's what you're paying for when you buy an expensive camera. You're actually paying to have that control as opposed to having someone else make that decision for you. Let me switch this camera back and you can see the difference. So in order to get this kind of image that I have going on here. So uh, another thing is that this means that there's a lot of equipment that you end up needing to, to buy. Let me show you this, this setup real quick. See if I can actually show it to you. Um, all right, transition here. Now this, this equipment is all in here. This is the camera. This camera costs about, I don't know, $3,000. It's as much as the, uh, as, as the laptop itself. Not to mention all the support equipment that you're seeing all around here in order to make this setup one that I choose rather than one that the uh, producers uh, on uh, for, um, uh, for my MacBook Pro uh, use. So yeah, um, let's see about that then. Let's switch now. Okay, so uh, there's cameras that make a lot of assumptions about what you want. Uh, for one thing, there's audio engineering as well that goes into this video, which you're seeing, including photography. Also, cinematography is involved with this. Uh, there is a very big difference between having a camera angle like this versus having a camera angle that's pointed up at your chin. Uh, that has a different psychological impact on the people around you, and you might not realize it, but uh, that does need to be taken into account. Uh, then there's also telephony when you're talking about WebRTC, because you're talking about streaming a image um, from one person uh, to, uh, uh, to another and then having it come back and having it do so in a reasonable amount of time. Um, moving on, there's also all these other things that are going on here like shutter speed, frame rate, encoding, lens physics, exposure, ISO, bit depth, noise cancellation, aperture, aspect ratio, white balance, tint, contrast. I could go on, uh, but I'm not going to. My point is to say that this is really complicated stuff. Uh, and each one of these things is its own field of engineering. And here I am trying to take all of this and do all of it myself and also be the performer while I'm, at, while I'm doing all of that. So enter WebRTC. WebRTC is an open source framework that is built by Google. Uh, they, uh, and uh, they did it so that they could have real-time communications, that's what the RTC stands for, going back and forth between two browsers without having any, any intermediary. And the idea here was that that was going to be very low latency, which is really cool. Um, so uh, that means you use your browser, you get the camera, and you send the feed. And that's all it really does. It also receives feed uh, as well. And so this is a vast oversimplification of what's going on. But this is what you'll see. Um, it is ultra low latency, which is really nice if you're going to be uh, having a, uh, like a conversation with somebody else, especially if you're discovering scene work on the spot uh, and deciding that someone else is your mother and that you know they're about to die or whatever. Um, if you're going for high drama, maybe that can be hilarious. No, no, it really can't be hilarious. Never mind. Um, so uh, let's just sort of, in a nutshell, uh, WebRTC is like a flashlight, to mix my metaphors, uh, except that the flashlight does not have its own batteries. Uh, you have to bring your own. And also, there's no light bulb included. Uh, by the way, also, uh, you're going to need to build your own switch onto it. And also, it is... Uh, um, it has a chance to shock you electrically, or strangely enough, suck your blood sometimes, unexpectedly. Um, but this is essentially a, an, an analogy for what this is. So here we are, WebRTC. Uh, light bulb not included. Bring your own. All these fancy drawings I've got going on here. So here are some things that you need to consider when you're dealing with WebRTC. You need to deal with net traversal, which is getting uh, across network barriers. Uh, a lot of times uh, there are firewalls involved, especially if you're talking about um, uh, uh, administrative centers and things like that, corporate places or anything that's HIPAA compliant, you're going to need that as well. Uh, network connection is going to be an issue for you because you're talking about streaming data over the live internet and that is fluctuating at all times. Um, and out of your control. Processing power is another thing that you're going to need because you're encoding and decoding videos. And that means, uh, like right now, I'm probably encoding and decoding a number of times as I try and get this channel 
out to Twitch and then also to Zoom. Uh, and so uh, that's processor intensive. Uh, so you need a good amount of processing power. In fact, there is a chance that this laptop will overheat itself before this talk is over and everything will crash. Um, I've just become used to that, but that's true. Uh, there are ways of handling that, of course, uh, but um, uh, that is just something to be aware of. There's also signaling. Uh, it didn't mention that uh, for WebRTC, you need a way to let someone know that, hey, I want to give you a call. And then the other person say, hey, I hear that you want to give me a call. And, yeah, I'm going to give you a call now. OK, give me a call. And then the connection happens. So that signaling is also important. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's some of the things that are complex about it. But well, if you want more than two people, then you have to deal with things like uh, building an AWS infrastructure, or maybe you want to use another cloud hosting uh, provider out there. Uh, there are quite a few. Um, I'm going to mention AWS because we're on Twitch and Twitch is owned by Amazon. Okay, uh, so uh, I didn't need to do that. They, they, they don't care, <laughs> but I mean, you know, I did that. Uh, regions, uh, you also need to worry about uh, different laws in different countries uh, if you're going to be streaming across borders. Uh, if you're going to, you also need to worry about media servers now, things like um, having a centralized hub where all these signals come in and then go out instead of doing this mesh network like you're seeing down over here. Uh, if you're on Twitch, this makes sense. If you're on Zoom, I'm sorry. Um, then there's also security uh, to concern yourself uh, with. Um, and that is another issue as well that you definitely need to take care of because you can build up this entire infrastructure and if you don't keep it secure, other people can use it to make their own calls, just like uh, in a real telephone network. Uh, so how do you keep track of where you are streaming internationally uh, with regards to regulations? Um, and uh, well, uh, if you've got uh, media servers involved, then you need to you need to ask the question of where your where the media server is located. Where where is the actual data center where the hub of all these connections is coming in? Uh, also, by the way, that's going to make a difference in how much latency you've got. If my connection needs to go through Singapore, then it's going to be a lot slower than if it has to go through Los Angeles, which is almost right where I am. So yeah, that is another thing to consider. You could also go with third-party providers, but if you do that, you will run into the same kinds of problems you run into when you use your camera phone or your laptop phone, which is that you need to like the assumptions they make about you. Uh, you need to pay them to keep the lights on at all times, and you need to rest your success if this is a mission critical piece of equipment or a mission critical feature on their ability to deliver consistently and to not charge you more or anything else like that. So there's a real problem with vendor lock-in if you do that. Uh, that being said, it's a great way to rapidly prototype, so that might not be such a bad idea. Um, and if there are standard things that people need, because um, I could imagine like a world in which you know you can talk with a live agent about the, your your blah 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 or whatever it is that you're doing business about, and there's a WebRTC connection right there, done. Uh, it would be nice to have someone just have figured out all of these details for you already, uh, just so you can have that one feature. But if it's something that is like mission critical and it also needs to be specific. Um, Here's another question. Uh, do you think Google or WebRTC will get a lot of pushback from companies like Zoom or Twilio since they are removing the middleman? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons why. One is that Zoom, uh, Twilio is just using WebRTC. <laughs> it's just straight using WebRTC. It's just handling all this complexity for you. So they're going, thanks, Google, no problem. Um, the other thing is that Google's WebRTC API is one that is um, that leaves a lot to you, which is good in one sense, and also means that it will take you time to ramp this up in another sense. So um, Zoom gets its um, market share by the fact that they're ahead of the game and they have their own proprietary Franken version of WebRTC that they've built internally. And that uh, Franken version of things is so good and so powerful and so reliable and meets pretty much everyone's needs that makes it really hard for anyone else to enter into the market. So that's the strategy there for Zoom. Um, but uh, right now, this ecosystem works pretty well. Um, 
Uh, I don't think that in general there's a lot of pushback for open source technologies right now. Lots of companies still use it um, to uh, to rapidly get into the game, or if you want to uh, be uh, if, if you don't want to rely upon other companies to do your work for you, then open source tooling is exactly what you need. Uh, and so in that sense, bravo for WebRTC being free and open source. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, there are a number of different strategies and, and things that happen when you start using um, real-time communications, or well, sorry, not real-time communications. When you start using open source tools, uh, and when you open source something as a company, there is a strategy around that about why you would even do that. Why would you give software away for free? Um, there are people like me who are just idealistic and say, yeah, we should have it for free. Um, but uh, why a company does it, uh, there's a number of reasons. Uh, let me uh, get back to this, these slides here. Now, uh, WebRTC that you see in the wild is usually going to be single file examples um, or uh, single file pieces of code. Let me see if I can... Stop sharing. No, not stop sharing. I need to escape from here. Go over to here. Um, okay, so this right here is OBS Ninja. Um, and OBS Ninja is one uh, uh, real, this is a really used uh, piece of WebRTC uh, that is in the wild right now that people use to stream low latency back and forth. Uh, with OBS. So this would be used for interview shows and things like that on Twitch, for example. Um, and you can see that really what's going on here is it's all just one gigantic JavaScript file, the whole thing. Here is it, main.js, and here it is, just keeps going. So if you're having a hard time following this, partially it's because of the fact that I'm scrolling through it so fast, and the other part of it is that this is um, uh, not uh, what I would consider clean, although at least, you know, there are words going on here. And I don't want to harsh on um, the creator of this because, oh my goodness, this tool is so useful. Um, but uh, it makes it very difficult for you to get in and change things or tweak it or make it your own. You really can't. It's just this monolithic thing uh, that you just get. Um, and it just works so long as you just need it to just work, and you don't need to extend it in any way, then uh, that's great. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see this keeps going. I'm not even done yet. I, I could just keep keep talking for like another couple of minutes on exactly how long this file really is. Um, but uh, you know, someone actually went through and coded all of this, which is really actually very impressive. <laughs> not even a third of the way down yet. So I'm going to stop here just because there's really no point in getting to the end of this file. I mean, what's really going to happen? Are we going to learn something? No. So I'm just going to switch back. <laughs> um, there we are. Back to presenting. So that's the kind of thing that exists in the wild. And when you see single page examples like that, what ends up happening is that um, you tend to extend what's already there rather than starting to abstract pull out, use uh, what I would call solid design principles. So what if we were to create a WebRTC um, implementation that was with solid design principles? Uh, and what do I mean by solid design principles? Um, I can list these off, I think. Uh, single responsibility principle. Uh, there's the open close principle, list cost substitution. Uh, what's the I? I'll get it in a second. D is, oh, I is interface segregation. And D, anyone know D in the chat? Somebody knows D in the chat. Um, but really, uh, the key thing about solid design principles is really just about the single responsibility principle. That first one really covers all the others. Um, dependency inversion. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, that's it. Dependency inversion, uh, which uh, is can definitely happen if you've got a file that is, you know, several thousand lines long. Uh, there might be things going on in there, uh, which makes it really difficult for you to get in, get your hands dirty with it, try and figure out how to actually engineer this stuff. Um, but um, really what this comes down to is, can we get WebRTC with single responsibility principle? That is like, 
the camera is taken care of by itself. The feed is taken care of by itself. The, um, uh, the signaling is its own separate file. And these things just get called together. So from a high level, you can just understand that. Yeah, uh, this is really just SRP. And really what we mean by just SRP is we need, mean really just name things nice. That's really all we're doing. We're just naming things nice and putting them in their own files, and that's it. And when we put them in their own files, it's just the stuff that it cares about, not, the, not anything else. You know, there's no extra stuff. Like, my jar of mayonnaise for my sandwich does not also have pickled salmon in it. Uh, there's no need for that. I can have a jar of pickled salmon, a jar of mayonnaise, and if I want mayonnaise with pickled salmon in it, I can put those together myself. But I want them in separate jars to begin with. Just for, you know, uh, another analogy. I'm, I'm rolling with these analogies. Did I mention that I do improv? I do. Um, so, uh, uh, this comes down to just use your words. Use words and put things in a way that makes sense, and that's it. That's all you need to do. Um, there's, it's not really that hard, but it does become hard if you don't do it from the beginning. And when you get single page examples that are just extended into really big single page examples, um, and that just continues, uh, then it, as long as you don't need it to change in any way, you're fine. And at that point, why even bother writing your own? You might as well just go ahead and use the third party. Um, so uh, WebRTC, what if we test drive it? Um, what does that mean, test-driven development? Uh, there's a couple of ways we can do test-driven development, of course, um, but, um, and I forgot to actually, or um, I didn't forget, I just failed to put the right slide in here. So I'm gonna just draw this right now. Um, so here is our testing pyramid. This is the standard testing pyramid. You would do manual tests up here. That means actually, um, making a call with your WebRTC app um, and checking to see that everything is working the way it should be. Then you would have integration tests a step below that. Integration tests are the kinds of things that, you know, React would really like. Um, also, if any of you guys are into uh, Selenium, uh, that's another, uh, another integration test thing. Integration tests are great because they are they, they validate actual behavior, um, but they also, um, uh, they're also pretty expensive to run. They take time. They don't take as much time as like actually making a call and like, hey, are you getting my signal? Yeah, I'm getting your signal. Are you getting my signal? Yeah, I'm getting your signal. Hey, is there any problems with my signal? Okay, no, well, I, I, maybe, uh, I think it's fine. Uh, down here is another la lever, yeah. Uh, do you just run that Monster.js in a Node instance? Um, yeah, on, um, when you're talking about uh, OBS Ninja. OBS Ninja you, is deployed. Is, there's a website. And because it's all JavaScript code, you just get the code and it just runs. Um, it runs through your browser. Um, nothing else knows about it. Uh, you don't have to run it in a Node instance. You could if you wanted to, um, but good luck trying to figure out how to get into it to do that. Um, and then the final one is unit tests. Now, in a typical testing pyramid, you'd want this unit test to be at the bottom here. At least this is the classic way in which um, you would do things for a Rails app or something like that. Uh, and the unit tests are really what design your app and help you to maintain single responsibility. Um, but yeah integration or unit tests. Um, doing it this way is more common. Um, although it would be really nice if we at least got to the point where we were using mostly integration tests rather than bothering with millions of manual calls, which by the way is something that actually happens in te telephoning engineering stuff. That's not a proper term, but in, when you're making calls, they, they used to actually just employ a bank of people making calls and then writing down their score of how good the quality was. Uh, we can't really do that for software engineering. Uh, that's just, uh, it's just gonna be hard. Um, there's also no need. We can actually create automated tests for it. Uh, but yeah, um, for like, when it comes to something like uh, React, for example, which is a front-end framework, um, React, 
usually they like to do uh, integration tests first because they find that the unit tests lock them into one design pattern and they don't want to, um, uh, they, they, they want to have the freedom and flexibility to refactor. That makes sense. Uh, but proper unit tests actually do help figure out single responsibility principle. Um, because without those, um, you can just make a mess. Uh, and there are plenty of React apps that are just a mess. So, yeah, um, there's a balancing act here. Um, but what if we could know ahead of time that the call was going to work? What if we could know the quality of that call? What if we could know... Um, uh, what if that knowledge and those tests could allow us to change easily? Uh, what if that would allow it for more engineers to actually work with WebRTC? Uh, we could get juniors to be able to understand it more quickly and they could actually focus on one portion of it. For that matter, it helps with the seniors as well. I mean, I, I don't move any faster for, you know, working with not clean code. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, with that, like, consider the impact uh, streaming real-time communications can have on humanity. Like, what kinds of things can we do? Uh, there are a lot uh, of that. <laughs> Giraffe codes, yeah, uh, I know. Uh, I've had messy React apps myself. I get you, no problem. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, that is the end of my talk. <laughs> um, uh, and really, it's more of a request for comments about how we might test drive some of this stuff, like the integration tests, for example. How do you integration test when you need a live connection through the internet in order to properly test it? What does that even look like? What kind of a framework would that be? Um, how about unit testing? How do you actually break this thing into pieces to make it work? Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, if you want uh, some YouTube talks, uh, you can go to my channel. There's FTL Talks. Uh, endcarroll.medium.com for my blog posts. They're usually about um, uh, Scrum and um, Agile development stuff. So check that out. 